What is the outlook for Josh Allen and the Buffalo Bills quarterbacks in 2024? I'm breaking that down for you today on Locked on Bills. You are Locked on Bills, your daily Buffalo Bills podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Bills Mafia? It's Joe Marino, author of Go Bills and Buffalo's Run, also the co-host of the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast, and I'm your host of Locked On Bills. I want to thank you for making Locked On Bills your first listen every day, and a big welcome and shout out to our everydayers. You know who you are. Those of you who never miss a single episode, I appreciate y'all being here very, very much. I'd also like to invite you to subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. As playoffs wind down, the sports stop sporting like we want them to. But this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. Just visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. Well, folks, welcome in. Excited to have a Josh Allen conversation with you on the podcast. I want to really talk about the 2024 edition of Josh Allen. What excites me about that? What makes me nervous? And then I want to get into the contract. You're seeing quarterbacks getting deals left and right that are placing them at a higher pay grade than Josh Allen, despite being nowhere near as good as Josh Allen. So I want to discuss that, and then finally, the backup quarterback situation with Mitchell Trubisky back in the fray. So in some sense, we're going to preview the Buffalo Bills quarterbacks, but that's such a boring way to package it. I want to kind of do my own thing and just talk about the dynamics, because if you just see, well, it's a position preview for the Bills quarterbacks, eh, that's not too interesting. I want to kind of look at this through a a bunch of different lenses to paint a picture of how to set the expectations for Josh Allen in 2024, or at least what's on my mind when it comes to that. So let's do start with some exciting stuff. And that is what excites me about Josh Allen in 2024. And the leading comment that I'll make is that it's the unknown variables that makes 2024 so exciting for me to watch Josh Allen. We've seen Josh Allen operate in this Brian Dayball, Ken Dorsey offense with Stephon Diggs and Gabe Davis, and we know what that looks like. We don't know what Josh Allen looks like in a Joe Brady offense without Diggs, without Davis, with a heavy emphasis on Dalton Kincaid and 12 personnel. Khalil Shakir is a young emerging talent. Keon Coleman. Marquez Valdez-Scantling, does Chase Claypool do anything? Matt Collins, so many new pieces around Josh Allen. And of course, the implementation of Joe Brady as the permanent full-time offensive coordinator. We don't know what that looks like. And those unknowns make it very intriguing to me. And just think about it through this lens. Stephon Diggs isn't here, and I don't want to get into that. But you do know that the presence of Stephon Diggs means 150 targets going to that guy. That burden for, I guess that's just the way I'm going to choose to say it. I wasn't going to say for lack of better terms. There's better terms. But the burden, I'm going to call it, of making sure that Stephon Diggs gets his is gone. Josh Allen, I think that could lead to some freedom in how he executes and runs the offense. How he decides to read coverages, where he starts his eyes, what the progressions look like without a Stephon Diggs being the primary option in the passing game. I think Dalton Kincaid is going to be the primary option. I think Khalil Shakir is going to have a big role. But Curtis Samuel could have a big role too, and so could Keon Coleman. It's, It's fascinating to consider that. It's fascinating to consider Josh Allen as a facilitator with all these different weapons and how it all comes together. What does that mean for Josh Allen's approach? What does that mean for his execution? It's fascinating. I'm interested in finding out. The next thing I want to get into is what seems like an obvious statement, 
But let me explain. What makes me excited for Josh Allen in 2024 is that it's beyond clear that this is his show. Not that there was ever any doubt. Josh Allen's not only the face of the Buffalo Bills, but he's one of the faces of the NFL. This is clearly his football team. But with Stephon Diggs gone, this is clearly his show on offense. You've heard Joe Brady put it like this, and I love it. He said, this isn't a Joe Brady offense. This is a Josh Allen offense. Everything appears to be funneling through Josh Allen. The structure of the offense, what they want to be, the identity, all of that. And that's exciting for me. And this feels like an offseason for Josh Allen where there was a lot of intentionality be- behind what he was doing. And I've been critical of, of kind of what I think the offense offseasons have looked like for Josh Allen. But I, I it appears he's in great shape. It appears that he's really working on some of the fundamentals of the position you heard him talk about. The biggest emphasis for him this offseason has been his own mechanics. And I've gotten into that quite a bit on the show, but I think that's a big deal. You go back to 2020 and the big breakout that Josh Allen had, and a lot of that was digitally mapping his mechanics and finding out where there was issues to become a more consistent thrower, which leads to more accuracy. Well, as I've stated and reminded you that the last two years, Josh Allen's had injuries to his throwing shoulder or his throwing arm, his shoulder, and then his elbow. And through that, your mechanics could obviously be affected because you're trying to work through the deficiency caused by the injury. And digitally mapping those out is going to highlight those things and give Josh Allen the opportunity to make some corrections and making sure that his stride's not long, making sure that his arm motion is not elongated, tightening things up, being more efficient, allowing him to have better placement with the football, not just down the field, but in the quick game. That'll help you get more yards after catch. There's so many good things that come from that. And Josh Allen has said he's been intentional about that. I think he's sounds like he's been more intentional about his diet and his overall regimen. I think those are all very good things to hear Josh Allen discuss. So clearly his show in an offseason that is very, very intentional for Josh Allen. I also find excitement from this there should be some strong lessons learned to be applied from the Ken Dorsey experience where you transition away from Brian Dayball, you go to the quarterback's coach in Ken Dorsey, who was Josh Allen's preferred choice to be the offensive coordinator. You get through a season and a half and you realize that this isn't really working out. And maybe there were some things taken for granted in that transition. And I hope that the experience of having gone through that transition and some of the failures within it leads to a more successful transition this time around to Joe Brady. It certainly felt like, at least at the start of of last season, that eventually led to the firing of Ken Dorsey in season, that the offense became more of a Ken Dorsey offense, which is, okay, we're going to win with our brain, right? We're going to be progression style. We're going to be concept style based on reading coverage and everyone being on the same page. And if everybody sees it the exact same way, it's going to be really successful. But if anything's off, you're going to have challenges. It's going to look disjointed at times. The sequencing with play calls, the sequencing with route concepts, it felt just a little bit off. And maybe that was, and and including the run game dynamics, which I'll get to in the next segment, the run game dynamics as it relates to Josh Allen. Felt like there was some odd intentionality behind what that offense was designed to be and how Josh Allen fit into that. At least I don't feel that way right now from the messaging that we're getting from the coaches and players at this point in the offseason discussing what this unit's going to look like in 2024. So those lessons applied from the Ken Dorsey experience, I'm hopeful that that uh, can lead to an even more dynamic version of Josh Allen. And the last thing that I'll say is if you remember when the Chargers hired Harbaugh as their coach, one of the things that he said was, imagine Justin Herbert with a run game. 
Well, Josh Allen has a run game. And I have a lot of confidence in it because of how it performed down the stretch. But you now have the opportunity to evolve that. You have some some continuity with your offensive line in three spots. I guess four players, three spots. Osiris Torrance, year two, who's going to be a big asset to your run game. What we've seen from Spencer Brown, from Deion Dawkins, how Aaron Cromer has taken a leading role in designing this run game. James Cook and his production with a better cast of backs with him. I have a lot of confidence in this run game, and that excites me for what it means for Josh Allen and the passing game and the threat of being two-dimensional and how much stress that puts on defenses. So when I think about, all right, why should I be excited about Josh Allen in 2024? That's the stuff that comes to mind. The unknowns, the undeniable truth to it being his show, the intentional offseason that he's had, the lessons that can be applied from the Ken Dorsey experience and this run game and how that's going to potentially open up even more in the passing game. So plenty of reasons to be excited. On the other side of it, I want to talk about some growth areas that I'm looking for specifically from Josh Allen. So be sure to stick with me. I love sports. I love them so much and never want them to stop. But as the playoffs wind down, we get fewer games and the sports aren't sporting like we want them to. But FanDuel lets me keep the sports going whenever I want. All I have to do is open the app and dream up bets anytime that I'm in the mood. And this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a booster bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. In fact, you can get in on some football's futures bets. Got some cool stuff as it relates to the Buffalo Bills. Right now, Josh Allen plus 800 to be the NFL MVP. They have Dalton Kincaid's receiving yards, the over-under set at 775 and a half. I like the over there. Bills at plus 165 to win the AFC East. That's the best odds of any team in the division. So head on over to FanDuel.com slash locked on and start making the most out of your summer. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. All right, let's talk some growth areas for Josh Allen that I'm looking for. I have three things written down here. The number one thing that I want to talk about is facilitating the offense with so much new around him. 37% of Josh Allen's targets from last year have been vacated. You know it. Diggs is gone. Davis is gone. But so is Trent Sherfield. So is Deontay Hardy. There's a lot of turnover with the wide receiver core. You know it. Khalil Shakir the only wide receiver to catch a pass from Josh Allen in a game. And if you go back to 2023, and I'm glad that I keep a lot of notes because as I build show concepts, I go back and look at my previous notes and it allows me to be reminded of things to kind of string it together. But one of the things that we talked about early in 2023 was this idea that Josh Allen reverted to throwing the ball to Stephon Diggs. And obviously Stephon Diggs had a ton of production early in 2023, but at the same time, we were asking ourselves, well, what's up with Dalton Kincaid? Why isn't he more of a thing? And why isn't Gabe Davis more of a thing? It was like, all right, just Josh Allen's just going to revert to throwing the ball to Stephon Diggs all the time. And you love the production from Diggs, but there was definitely questions about involving other players. And I thought that uh, that offense in 2023, before later in the season, I thought it had an identity crisis that impacted Josh Allen tremendously. They're trying to incorporate 12 personnel with the drafting of Dalton Kincaid and what you're paying Dawson Knox. So like structurally, you're completely different than you've ever been under Josh Allen. You have two brand new guards in Osiris Torrance and Connor McGovern, a new lead running back in James Cook. You know, Devin Singletary had been the lead back for four years. Trent Sherfield and Dante Hardy, you're trying to figure out what their roles are going to be. And it was like, revert to Diggs. Just throw the ball to Diggs. All this is weird and new. We're going to throw the ball to Diggs. Well, if you thought there was turnover at the beginning of last season, as you know, it's even more drastic right now. I'm ha happy that the catalyst for the offense down the stretch are still part of the mix. It's you know, For as much as the people want to talk about not having Diggs and not having Davis, those guys weren't the catalyst for the offense down the stretch. It was Dalton Kincaid, Jalil Shakir, and James Cook. Those guys are part of this mix. 
from week 13 on, Dalton Kincaid, your leading receiver. From week 12 on, Khalil Shakir, excuse me, for the last 13 games, I, I didn't say that correctly, for the last 13 games of the season, including the playoffs, Dalton Kincaid led the team in receiving for the last 12 games of the season. Khalil Shakir led the team in receiving. Oh, by the way, you know what James Cook did. Those were your offensive catalysts. Those guys are all still around, but a lot of new around them. Of course, a new offensive lineman at left guard, a new center in Connor McGovern. I know he's a returning player, but in a new spot. Two new, or at least one new backup running back in Ray Davis that you're going to incorporate. And everything's new at wide receiver out of Khalil Shakir. With you would you'd feel like the scheme fundamentally is a little bit different with Joe Brady having an offseason to implement and install things. And I've never thought of Josh Allen as a facilitator. And I think that Josh Allen has always been a guy that wants to throw the ball to players that he trusts. And I think any quarterback would want that to be the case. But there's so many players that he has to build rapport, chemistry, timing with. He's got to build trust with. And so how does Josh Allen maximize this idea that the Bills are going to share the ball? Again. Kincaid, Shakir, they're going to get theirs. I'm confident in that. But you still have, I mean, even if those guys got 220 targets combined, you're going to throw the ball 600 times. You got a lot of other throws to figure out. How does Josh Allen develop that timing and chemistry and trust? How quickly does it happen with guys he's never played with? And in the case of Keon Coleman, a rookie. I think that's going to be an important piece of this. So Josh Allen becoming that facilitator and getting players involved, particularly players he's never worked with before. So that's number one. Number two is consistency with Josh Allen's involvement running the football, whether that's design runs or scrambles. It's been a conversation we've had every year. I don't think it's going away. I lived, and I still do, I live in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, during the Cam Newton era, and it was a never-ending conversation of Cam Newton's running volume, how much is too much, but you don't want to take away from what makes him a you know such a dynamic player. And all it's very similar to what happens with Josh Allen in terms of the conversation. Well, earlier in the season last year, Josh Allen really didn't run the ball. With Ken Dorsey as the offensive coordinator through 10 games, 4.2 rushing attempts per game. When Joe Brady became the offensive coordinator for the last nine games, Josh Allen ran the ball 9.2 times per game. So was it, okay, new coordinator, let Josh Allen be Josh Allen? Probably some of that. Was there some intentionality early in the season to reduce Josh Allen's involvement in the run game? And then would it have been as frequent later in the season if the Bills weren't so desperate to win games and go on a run and get to the playoffs? So what's the the deal here? Like, how do we thread this needle? I think Josh Allen should run the football. Those are good plays for the Bills offense. Josh Allen's been by far the most durable quarterback in the NFL. Quarterbacks don't get hurt running the football. They get hurt taking hits in the pocket. I've said that repeatedly. But I think part of what makes Josh Allen such a great player that's hard to defend is his dual threat ability. And I think there should be a consistent element to Josh Allen running the football. Not 9.2 times per game, but also not 4.2 times per game. And so I know that it's probably a week-to-week conversation, but I I want there to be this freedom from not only Josh Allen to take off when he needs to, but from Joe Brady to incorporate that as necessary, where it felt like earlier in the season last year, maybe that stuff wasn't really there. The last thing I want to get into, and I touched on this Friday of last week, was the vertical passing nature, vertical passing production, throws 20 yards or more down the field. Josh Allen didn't fare well. On throws 20 yards or more down the field, Josh Allen was 29 of 82. That's a completion percentage of 35%. 21st in the NFL, 962 yards, eight touchdowns, nine interceptions, passer rating of 73.4, which is 25th in the NFL. And as I shared on Friday, the the players that are around him in that bunch, Mac Jones, Bailey Zappi, Kenny Pickett, 
Bryce Young, Zach Wilson. And I will also, once again, throw Patrick Mahomes under the bus because his passer rating on throws 20 yards or more down the field was 49.1, which was second worst in the NFL. But this is an area that I, I'm hopeful to see more efficiency and more production, quite honestly. But throw the ball down the field and do it well. And I'm hopeful that the mechanics from Josh Allen improve to have better ball placement. I'm hoping that the scheme is well-structured for some vertical shots, and I'm hopeful that this mix of receivers can be helpful in making more plays down the field, especially when they have the chance to. That was an issue at times last year where the throw was there, the scheme was there, the receiver failed. There were times where the scheme failed. There was times where Josh Allen failed. Well, all of, all of it needs to be better. All of it needs to be better. The Bills need to be able to have some of those explosive plays down the field. I mean, only 29, only 29 completions last year. 20 yards or more down the field. You want more when Josh Allen is your quarterback. So those are the three big growth areas that I'm looking for. Facilitating the offense, consistency with his involvement in the rushing offense, and vertical passing. All right, on the other side of it, I want to talk about this contract situation as it relates to Josh Allen and, of course, Mitch Trubisky back as QB2. So be sure to stick with me. You're thinking about it. I'm thinking about it. It's Josh Allen's contract. And not that it's expiring anytime soon, but Josh Allen has very quickly become severely underpaid. And I know that that's crazy to talk about somebody who's making $43 million a season as underpaid, but that's the market. That's the market for NFL quarterbacks. And if you want to make $43 million a season, go become an amazing NFL starting quarterback, and you too can make that type of money. But the reality is that Josh Allen is underpaid. And I'm certain that Brandon Bean is not sitting in his ivory tower with his fingers crossed, just hoping Josh Allen doesn't wake up one day and realize that he's underpaid. So let's talk about it, and let's talk about what maybe the Bills can do here. So Josh Allen is entering year two of his six-year, $258 million contract that pays him an average annual salary of $43 million. At the time when he signed the deal, that made him the second highest paid quarterback in the league behind Patrick Mahomes. Fast forward to today, now he's the 11th highest paid quarterback in the NFL. 11th in terms of average annual salary. Trevor Lawrence is now number one at 55. Or I suppose he's tied with Joe Burrow, who's also at 55. Jared Goff, 53. Justin Herbert, 52 and a half. Lamar Jackson, 52. Jalen Hurts, 51. Kyler Murray, 46.1. Deshaun Watson, 46. Patrick Mahomes, 45. And Josh Allen, 43. And there's going to be contracts that are handed out in the relatively near future to Tua, Dak Prescott, and Jordan Love. And if all of that happens, Josh Allen's going to be the 14th highest paid quarterback in the NFL when we all know he's the second best one behind Patrick Mahomes. Now, I guess if there's any good news in terms of Josh Allen's contract status is that it's still sixth in total value at $258 million. And in terms of cap percentage of cap at signing, APY, 23.56 percentage of cap at signing, that was that's still the second highest of any player in, in the history of the NFL. So it's not like he wasn't given a market deal, and he's it's not like he's not paid a lot of money, but relative to the rest of these quarterbacks, you know, Josh Allen is obviously lagging behind, which is also true with Patrick Mahomes. You may have noticed that I mentioned him at $45 million. Well, the Chiefs have done something here. Entering 2023, the Chiefs kind of reworked this deal. Here's what they did. They agreed to, to terms on a restructured contract that pays Mahomes $210.6 million between 2023 and 2026. That's the most in the history of the NFL over a four-year span. That at the time, was over $53 million. It still is over $53 million, and that was by far making him the highest-paid quarterback during that stretch. And there's also escalators in the deal that could push it up to $218 million over four seasons. And then it was widely understood and reported that both parties are willing to re-look at the contract or revisit the contract after 2026. So they did that 
entering 2023. There's a chance that the Bills do something like that with Josh Allen entering this season. And so how did the Chiefs pull that off? Well, what they did is they moved up money from the end of the deal. And if you remember, Patrick Mahomes signed a 10-year, $450 million deal originally. And the last several years of that deal, none of that money was guaranteed. And so they just took a bunch of that money, moved it up. That's what they did. And so as a result of that, Patrick Mahomes' cap hit in 2025 is scheduled to be $66 million against the cap. In 2026, it's scheduled to be $69 million against the cap. And the Chiefs have had to make some hard decisions. They traded away Tyreek Hill. They traded away Legereus Sneed. It's part of the deal when you have one of these quarterbacks like this. But at some point, something's got to happen here with this contract for Josh Allen. And I know he's only entering year two of a six-year deal, but like it's just a different ball game with these quarterbacks. The market is the market. And I don't th- I don't think you can just sit there and let the let the deal play itself out. That's just not what's going to happen here. So whatever creative ideas Brandon Bean has, time to deploy him here and and make sure that this works out. Not that I'd ever expect, you know, Josh Allen to like hold out or make a big public thing about this, but I think what a, a good organization should do is understand Josh Allen's status in the league, Josh Allen's status to your team and make sure that this is taken care of. The, the right way. And I think that the Chiefs have kind of put out a, a pretty good blueprint as to how to do that. Now, I don't think the Bills might not have the same level of flexibility that the Chiefs did with all the years. It was a 10-year deal. And again, like I said, a lot of those last few years, none of that money was guaranteed, so they were able to do this. Again, Brandon Bean's not going to wake up tomorrow, listen to this podcast, and be like, oh, man, I got to do figure something out. He's certainly been thinking about this and strategizing. I'm curious to see what that is. but. I think it's a very relevant talking point right now as it relates to Josh Allen. Now let's talk about backup quarterback. And I want to start the conversation with backup quarterback by acknowledging that Josh Allen is by far the most durable quarterback in the NFL. He has started 88 consecutive games. That's the longest active streak in the NFL by 53 games. I repeat, Josh Allen has the longest active start streak among NFL quarterbacks by 53 games. 17th longest streak in the history of the NFL right now he's on. So you love that. But then you're also, I don't know, like there's the other side of that that says, when's it coming? When's he going to have to miss some time? There's no rule saying that it has to happen, but law of averages tells you that at some point it's probably going to happen. So the Bills have brought in, or brought back, I guess, Mitchell Trubisky, to be the backup quarterback. So it was like Matt Barkley, Mitch Trubisky, Case Keenum, Kyle Allen, and now we're back to Mitch Trubisky. Signed a two-year, $5.25 million deal. He's 29, turns 30 in August. Of course, he was the Bills backup in 2021. Spent the last two seasons with the Steelers. Of course, you remember him as the number two pick in 2017. Four-year starter for the Chicago Bears. And um, he was, I mean, he wasn't terrible for the Bears. He uh, was a 57, he's started 57 games so far in the NFL as a winning record as a starting quarterback and like had took the Bears to the playoffs. Like he's not, he's not terrible. Now, since he's left Buffalo, hasn't been a great situation. Two years in Pittsburgh, got a chance to start seven games. And keeping in mind, they signed him to a two year, $14.3 million deal. You know, they needed something going on at quarterback. I mean, obviously drafted Kenny Pickett in the first round. But neither Kenny Pickett nor Mitchell Trubisky worked out, and now Pittsburgh's on to Russell Wilson and Justin Fields. In seven starts in Pittsburgh, Trubisky was 2-5, and completed 64% of his passes, 157 passing yards per game, eight touchdowns, 10 interceptions, passer rating of 77.6. That's not great. Also not a great situation. The offense in Pittsburgh has been terrible. The two seasons that Trubisky was there, they were bottom eight in overall offense in 2022 and 2023. Matt Canada, the offensive coordinator, offensive line problems, receiver talent issues, like they had problems. And so, no, Trubisky hasn't played good football in the two years that he's had a chance to in Pittsburgh. 
and we never saw him play for the Bills. So, like, we romanticize over the idea of, of who, who Mitchell Trubisky is, but if you look at what he's done over the last two years, not great. You go back and think about him with the Bears, and you're like, okay, you know, not a franchise quarterback, but you can do worse as your backup. And then you just kind of like the idea of him with Josh Allen with what you feel like is a pretty secure infrastructure that gives him a chance to play decent football. I really don't have any issues with Trubisky as the backup quarterback. Perfectly fine. But I'm also perfectly fine with Josh Allen's consecutive start streak extending by however many games the Bills play this year. And the only thing we have to see Mitch Trubisky do is kneel down the ball a couple times or maybe the Bills have a blowout win and hand it off a couple of times and get out of a game. But I do think that Kyle Allen to Mitch Trubisky I think the Bills upgraded the backup quarterback position quite a bit. So there you have it. The dynamics for Josh Allen and the Bills quarterbacks entering 2024. Talked about why I'm excited, where I'm looking for growth, the contract, the backup quarterback, all the stuff we did here on this episode. I hope that you enjoyed. I hope that you'll come back. I hope that you'll take a second to rate, review, and share the podcast. Have a great rest of your day. Go Bills, and I look forward to catching up with you again real soon.